أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد أرسلنا رسلنا بالبينات وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس بالقسط صدق الله العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبس منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تسالون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا صدق الله العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل لقمة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ربنا الهمنا رشدنا واعذنا من شرور انفسنا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم ارحمنا بالقران العظيم اللهم اجعله لنا اماما ونورا وهدى ورحمه اللهم ذكرنا منهما نسينا وعلمنا منهما جهلنا وارزقنا تلاوته آنا الليل وآنا النهار واجعله لنا حجة يا رب العالمين آمين Dear brothers and sisters and sons and daughters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته In the name of Allah and invoking his help we begin our study of the Qur'an from the beginning of Surah An-Nisa today. But let me refresh your memory with what I said in the very beginning in the introductory lecture about the grouping of the surahs of the Qur'an. As you know, Qur'an consists of 114 surahs. And they are grouped in two ways. One mode of grouping is what we call Ahzab or Manazil. In the Indian subcontinent we use the word Manzil. In the Arabic world the term is Hizb. The plural of Hizb is Ahzab. These seven Ahzab they are nearly equal in volume. And this grouping has been done only with the sole purpose that if a Muslim recites one hizb every day, he will complete the recitation of the whole of the Qur'an in a week. So to complete the recitation of the whole of the Qur'an in one week, Qur'an has been divided into seven ahzab. But they are not absolutely equal in volume or size. Because if you want to have absolutely equal azab, then you will have to break the surahs. Some surahs are very long. Some are very short. So that is why, you know, these azab are not absolutely equal. They are nearly equal. But there is a very beautiful design in this division. This division was present in the days of the Prophet and the companions. If you take away Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the preface to the whole of the Quran, which is called Ummul Kitab, Ummul Quran. Now three surahs comprise first manzil. Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa. The next has five surahs. The next has seven surahs. The next has nine surahs. The next eleven. The next thirteen. 
and the last comprises of 65 surahs. Again, a multiple of 13. 13 into 5 goes to be 65. It's a mathematical system. These are the ahsab. To facilitate a reciter who recites Quran every week. So these seven portions, he can easily recite one portion a day and complete the recitation of the whole of the Quran in one week. There's another grouping. And that grouping is based on the subject matter of the surahs. They, we know, everybody knows, that the Makki and the Madani surahs are interspersed in the whole of the Qur'an. We find four Madani surahs, very long, very lengthy. Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Baidah. Then two Makkis, Surah Al-Anam, which you heard in the Tarawih today. Then Surah Al-Araf. Again you have two Madanis. Which are they? Surah Al-Anfal, Surah Al-Tawbah. Then 14 surahs which are Makkis, and one surah which is Madani, that is Surah Al-Nur. Then several surahs Makki, and again one surah Madani, Surah Al-Ahzab. Then several Makki surahs, and then three surahs which are Madani, Surah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Surah Al-Fatih, and Surah Al-Hujrat. Then there are seven surahs Makki. And then ten surahs Madani, starting from Surah Al-Hadid and ending with Surah Al-Tahreem. Then you know most of the rest of the Qur'an comprises of the Makki surahs, except for a small number of the surahs in the end of the Qur'an, Jar Madani. So these are seven groups, Makki Madani, Makki Madani, Makki Madani, seven times. And each group comprising of one or more Makki surahs and one or more Madani surahs, it becomes a group. And this each group has a central theme. The Makki surahs of that group and the Madani surahs of, of that group, they are discussing the two aspects of that theme. The same theme. One aspect in the Makki surah and the other aspect in the Madani surahs. And so on. So the first group of these comprises of Surah Al-Fatiha, only one surah which is Makki. And what is the central theme of Surah Al-Fatiha? Ehdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem. O Allah, lead us to the right path. Sirat Al-Nazina Anamta Alayhim, Ghari Al-Maghdubi Alayhim, Wa Al-Dhalim. Hidayah, guidance, guide us. And not only guide us, lead us to the right path. Now the four Madani surahs are giving you that right path. What to do, what not to do. The main theme is Sharia. These things are permissible, they are halal. These things are prohibited, they are haram. You can go this way, not this way. So this is the guidance to the right path. So the main theme of the four Madani surahs, Surah Al-Fatih, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Maidah, is the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The right path. As-Sirat al-Mustaqeem. But there is a secondary theme also. And that is the dawa and then charge sheeting, the former Muslim Ummah, comprising of the Jews and the Christians. They were the former Muslim Ummah. They were the representatives of Allah on earth for 2,000 years. Moses, alayhi salatu was given Torah. 1400 years before Christ. And 600 years after Christ is the time of the advent of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So for 2000 long years, that was the ummah, Muslim ummah of that time. But they were deposed. 
a new ummah was created on the basis of the prophethood of, and messengerhood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We belong to that ummah, thanks to Allah. It's only by the grace of Allah that we belong to that ummah, because we were born as Muslims. It's only the grace of Allah subhanahu wa taala. But why that former ummah was deposed? So there is a long charge sheet against them. In all these four surahs, so these four surahs now, as I told you, has two themes. Number one, the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and number two, the Dawa and the charge sheet. When they are deposed. Are they doomed forever? No. The gate of the mercy of Allah is open for them also. They can also join this ummah. There is no bar. They can believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They can believe in Quran. The moment they do it, they become a part and parcel of this ummah. Asarab bukum an yarhamakum wa in uttum udna. This is the ayah in Surah Al-Bani Israel, which is the Makki Surah. Your Lord is still ready to have mercy upon you. Don't think you are doomed forever. You have been deposed from that position due to your misdeeds. We have created a new ummah. But you can join the ummah. This ummah is not based on any race. So you can join it. You can be a part and part of this ummah. In هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم. There is this Quran which is guiding to that path which is the most straight path. So this Dawa, come and join this Ummah. Come and believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Come and believe in this Quran, and the gates of the mercy of Allah are open for you. Allah is ready to embrace you in His mercy. Only if you have faith in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and only if you have faith in Quran, nothing more is required. The moment you say Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, you are equal to any Muslim in the world, not inferior to any Muslim. Now these four surahs they are divided, or you may say they are divisible. In two pairs of two surahs each, there are certain similarities, you know, between Surah Al Imran and Surah Al Bakara. For example, most apparent, both start with huruf muqattaat, the alphabets which are pronounced brokenly, separately. Alif, Lam, Mim, Zalik al Kitab al Arabi Bafi. This is the beginning of Surah Al Bakara. Alif Lam Mim Allahu La Ilaha Illahu. This is the beginning of Surah Al Ali Imran. The second, very apparent, prominent similarity. Both the surahs end with very grand prayers. Rabbana La Tuakhizna In Nasina Wa Aqtana. ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين and that is the end of سورة البقرة and we find in the last section of سورة آل إمران ربنا إننا سمعنا منادي أن ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فأمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخذنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد. very grand prayer. then we have the similarity. both the surahs can be divided nearly in two halves. but I can't go into more details. Now we are coming to the second pair, and this consists of Surah Al-Nisa and Surah Al-Maida. And you see, both start abruptly, both end abruptly. 
نو حروف مقطعات ان دی بگننگ اف صورت النساء یا ایوہ الناس اتقو ربکم اللذی خلقکم من نفس واحدت و خلق من هذا و جہا و بس منہما رجالا کثیرا و نساء و اتقو اللہ اللذی تسالون بہی و الارحام ان اللہ کان علیکم رقیم نو پری فیس نو پری ایمبل نو حروف مقطعات نو گلوریفیکیشن اف اللہ نو تسبیح نو تحمید نتنگ اف دی سارڈ ڈائریکٹ ایڈریس سٹارٹس فرم دی ویری بگننگ In the same way, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ya ayuhal ladhin amanu awfu bil uqood. Again, no huruf muqattaat, no tasbih, no tahmeed, nothing of the sort. This is the similarity between these two. And we shall be noting the other similar points when we are going through the translation, inshallah. I don't want to spend more of time in this introduction. Now we begin with Surah Al-Nisa, with the name of Allah again, and invoking His help again. Ya ayuhal nasu attaqu rabbakum al-lazhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidah. Let me tell you a few things about this Surah Al-Nisa as a whole also. This consists of 24 sections, 24 rukus, and 176 ayat. And you know, its subject can be divided into two parts. The address to the former Ummah, only 37 ayat out of 176 are addressing directly or indirectly the former Muslim Ummah with one name, Ya Ahl al-Kitab. Either inviting them to embrace Islam or charge sheeting them on their misdeeds. The rest, that is 139 ayat out of 176, they are addressing Muslims as Muslims. But this part also can be divided into two parts. A positive address to the Muslims, real Muslims, true Muslims, showing them the path. Showing them the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Showing them how to reform their society. How to uplift the degraded and downtrodden sections of society. This is what I am calling positive side. And there is a negative side also. 55 ayat I am labeling as positive. And... 84 as negative. And what do I mean by negative? Here actually, the hypocrites are being discussed and addressed. Who were legally Muslims? Because they were saying, Ashhadu Allah, ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. They were praying behind Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the mosque of the Prophet. But still they were lacking the real faith. They were hypocrites. So exposing them so that the Muslims should know the fifth columnist among their society. They should be aware of their designs and plots. It was necessary to expose them, the hypocrites, and what they were doing. To deciding them and also exhorting them to mend their ways, have a second look on your attitude, look what you are doing. You are condemning your own self, you will be doomed. Although you will think that you are Muslim, you, are, you will not be accept and acknowledge as Muslims on the day of judgment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we shall find in this surah the most, the strongest condemnation of munafiqeen. إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ These hypocrites will be in the lowest portion, lowest section of Jahannam, of the hell. They are more hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the kuffar. A kafir is openly kafir. 
If he's enemy, he's an open enemy. If he attacks you, he's attacking from front. But the Munafiq, a hypocrite, he's a hidden enemy. Just like a snake that you are carrying, it can bite you anywhere, at any time. So, the major portion of this surah, now note, total number of ayat 176. Out of these 176, 84 ayat, nearly half of this surah, that consists of dealing the subject of nifaq, criticizing the munafiqeen, exposing them, so that the Muslims should know and recognize the danger that they are facing from the hidden enemy within their ranks, in their society. And also advising them, exhorting them to mend their ways. Still, as I told you, as about the former Muslim Ummah, Allah is ready to embrace you with His mercy. Asarabbukum ayyarhamakum. So, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, aminu billahi wa rasoolihi, wal kitab illazhi nazara ala rasoolihi, wal kitab illazhi anzala bin qabl. Oh, you who profess to believe, but don't believe really, have real faith. There is still time to mend. You can save yourself from the eternal punishment of the hereafter, lest this time should finish. So this is the analysis of this surah. Now we beginning. We are beginning with the first part, but not one point more. These sections they are interwoven with each other. First. 43 ayat are the positive address to the Muslims. Do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. You have to respect the women folk. You should look after the orphans. You should divide, you know, whatever somebody, some deceased has left the property. It must be divided according to the rules of the Sharia and so on. The biggest thank, you know, to the address to the Muslims, it consists of positive ayat positive commandments, the do's and the don'ts of the Sharia. And then you know there is an address to the to the former Muslim Ummah, Yahya al-Kitab. Then there comes an address to the Munafiqeen, but not one thing. Nowhere in the Quran the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites are addressed as Ya yuhal lazina nafaku, Ya ya yuhal munafiqoon. Nowhere. Because they were also Muslims, legal Muslims. So they are also addressed, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. Oh, you who profess to believe, but lack the real belief. But these things are in bracket, not in express verse. Only you have to ponder over the subject of the ayat to decide whether the addressee of this ayat is the Muslim ummah, the real mu'min, or the addressee of these ayat are the munafiqun. So that you have to know for yourself. Now starting from the first section. Ya yuhanna suttaku rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum. O mankind, have taqwa of your Lord, your Master, your Rabb. Now to translate this word taqwa is very difficult, very difficult, rather impossible. Most of the translators, they use the word fear Allah, fear God, fear your Rabb, fear your Lord. To say the least, it is not appropriate. For fear, the word in Quran is khawf. Everybody knows. What is taqwa? Waqa yaqi means to save someone from some harm. And ittiqa means to save yourself. To save yourself from what? You save yourself from moral decay. And save yourself from the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the meaning of taqwa. Therefore I am glad that the, some of the modern translators, they are translating it in a different way. For example, have regard for Allah. Ya ayyuhal nasu taqurammakum. O mankind, have regard for your Lord. 
This is a better translation. O oh, you who believe, Ya yuhaladzina amanu taqullah haqqa tuqatihi. Remain mindful of your Lord. This is a better translation. Remain dutiful towards your Lord. Keep your moral sense alive. So at different places, I'll be diff using different words, but not fear. You know, we have given the opportunity to the Christians. They blame Quran. That Quran invokes fear. Fear is not a positive sentiment. It's negative. They say, Bible invokes love of Allah, love of God. And Quran invokes fear of Allah. And this is because we have translated so many words with one word and that is fear. Taqwa fear, khawf fear, khashiya fear. Inzar to, to make somebody fear. Fear and fear and fear and fear. So they had the chance due to this wrong translations. So we should use better words now. O mankind, have regard for your Lord. الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ Who created you out of one living being? Please note here. The word is not from Adam. Not from Bashar. Not from Rajul. Not that he created you out of one man. Or one human being. No. Nafs. What is nafs? Life. When you know the angel of Allah will come. Putting us to death, what will they say? Akhraju and Fusakum. Let me take out your life. Malakul Mawt will come and say, Akhraju and Fusakum. So, Nas means a living organism. So, Allah has created you all from one living organism, one living being. Wa khalaqa minha zawjaha. And He created. Out of that living being, its mate. Now this translation comes very near the modern biological and zoological ideas. You know, in the beginning, when life started on this planet Earth, the primitive forms of life, unicellular organism, it had no sex. The procreation was by the division. One cell dividing into two, two into four, four into eight, going on. That was a procreation. Later on, there appeared sex. And we find in the beginning, both sex, both sexes in one organism. Then at a later stage of evolution, the sex is separated. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ وَخَلَقَ مِنْ هَذَا وَجَهَا وَبَسَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَسِيرًا وَنِسَاءً Now when the sexes were separated, now there was Adam and Eve. And you know, the second ayah which has, which discusses the same theme in the Quran is, ayah number 13 of Surah Al-Hujarat. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْسَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّا أَكْرَمَكُمْ مِنْ ذَا اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Here, ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْسَى One male, one female. One man, one woman. Adam and Eve. But here it is, خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ وَخَلَقَ مِنْ هَذَا وَجَهَا وَبَسَّ he spread so many men and women in this earth. Five billions or six billions of them are today the progeny of Adam and Eve. What taqullah? Just note how important this taqwa is. In one ayah it is being emphasized again. Same ayah, the first ayah. What taqullah? Have regard for Allah. Remain mindful of your duties towards Allah. Keep Allah in your mind always. Never to forget. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَعَلُونَ بِهِ In whose name you ask each other. 
if some beggar is asking you for some alms, what does he say? Allah ke naam pe. In the name of Allah, please give me. In the name of Allah, please forgive me also, if you want to have forgiveness from somebody. I'm sorry, please forgive me. In the name of Allah, I appeal to you. So if you have to appeal to each other, and you ask each other any favors, with the name of Allah, so you must keep Allah, be yourself dutiful to Him, be yourself obedient to Him. And you must respect the relationship related to the wombs, the womb of the mother. Sons and daughters are coming from the same place. They have a relationship due to the womb of the mother, brothers and sisters. Now you rise up, the womb of the grandmother. Here the cousins, they join together. Both ascending. And you will read the womb of Eve, alayhi salatu wasalam. And the whole of mankind comes within the folds of a universal brotherhood. This is the relationship of the womb. Because I told you, the reformation of this society, that is the main subject of these first 43 ayahs of this surah. And what's the basis of society? The basis of society, the unit of society is a family. I read, you know, today there was a very big ad, full page ad, you know, in New York Times, perhaps yesterday or day before, from the American Family Association, perhaps. Now they are very much fearful. This institution is breaking. It has decayed. Even your, the president of the United States of America said that very soon the majority of the American nation will consist of bastards born out of any legal wedlock. One parent family. The family has gone to ruins. To reform this family, to make it a very strong institution, because, you know, the wall is made of blocks or bricks. If each brick is strong, then the wall will be strong. So this society is composed of families. If each family is strong, disciplined, organized, then the whole society will be organized and disciplined. And this family, what joins them is the womb, wombs of the mothers. Wal Arham, just note how much importance Quran is stressing on this kingship, this relationship due to wombs. Here you have to use the word ittaku again. Wattakul arham. Wal arhama. It is maful. Have regard for Allah. Wattakul arhama and have regard for this relationship. Based on the wombs of your mothers. In Allah Khan Alaikum Rahiba. Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watchful over you. He is seeing you, watching you, what you are doing. The second downtrodden section of the society, orphans. Women and then orphans. The women have been exalted. The womb of the mother brought closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wattakul arham. Wattakul lah alladhi tasaluna bihi wal arham. You know the position of the mother, the respect that you must show to her. Al-jannatu tahta akhdamil ummahat. The Prophet said, paradise is under the feet of the mothers. Now the second section, downtrodden, oppressed. Hand over to the orphans their properties and belongings. If somebody has died, as he has left orphans, they are still minor, they can't look after their affairs, the whole thing goes in the hands of the uncles, 
And now those uncles are not paying and giving away, giving over the property of the orphans to them. They are eating it up. So the, this, these are now uh, deprived. You must hand over the property of the orphans to them. Don't change anything which is bad of your possessions with something which is good in their possession. I will give these things to him. Well, the, the bad things I can change, you know. I can place here. I will complete the number of this orphan. You had, your father had left ten camels. Well, I have given you ten camels. But not the good camels that the father had left. But the weak ones. The diseased ones. وَلَا تَتَبَدَّلُوا خَبِيصَ بِالطَّيِّبِ وَلَا تَاكُلُوا أَمْوَالَهُمْ أَمْوَالَهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَمْوَالِكُمْ Don't try to eat up their property by mixing the, it, it, it with your own property. When you intermix the two, then it's very easy to be dishonest. You must keep the property of the orphan, which is under your guardianship, separate, discreet. Don't mix it with your, so that you can, knowingly or unknowingly, you misuse your authority and you eat up their property. إِنَّهُ كَانَ حُوبًا كَبِيرًا Verily, it's a very big crime in the eyes of Allah. And if you fear, you are afraid that you will not be able to do justice to the orphan girls. This ayah is very important because some of the people who don't believe in hadith or sunnah of the Prophet, the munkareen of sunnah, they have misinterpreted this ayah. The real interpretation comes from a hadith. From Aisha of Allah Ta'ala Anha. And we shall see that that very explanation is given by Quran itself in ayah number 127 of this very surah. We shall read it, inshallah. What is the background of this ayah? Because, you know, if somebody had minor orphan girls under his guardianship and that minor girl had some property also which was left over by her parents. Now a person who is the guardian marries her. There's no need of giving any dowry. She's under your control. She's already under your thumb. And there's nobody to ask for her rights. You can treat her as you like. Because she was an orphan. She didn't have anybody, any father, any brothers to look after her rights. So they used to do it. Well, this is the orphan. I marry her. Now all the property comes to me and nobody is there to ask for the rights of this orphan girl. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تُخْسِتُوا فِي الْيَتَامَةِ If you are afraid that you won't be able to do justice in case of the orphan girls. Here yatama means the orphan girls. فَانْكِحُوا don't marry them, but marry ma taba lakum in nisa You can marry other women who please you, whom you like. Masna wa sulasa wa ruba. The sharia of Allah is allowing you to have two wives at a time, three at a time, even four at a time, not more. That is the last. Masna wa sulasa wa ruba. There are so many women. If you have to marry, you can marry other women. Don't marry this orphan girl which is under your guardianship because you won't be able to do justice to her. And she will not be backed by any support from his, her own family. So you are very much liable to do injustice. One. You are allowed to marry two or three or four at a time. But this permission of marrying more than one woman is conditional. If you are afraid you won't be able to do justice between these wives, then you should have only one wife because you have to do justice. Justice in all the measurable things. 
All the measurable things, the time that you spend with this wife must be equal to the time you are spending with the other wife. The money that you are giving monthly for household management to this wife, the same money should be given to the other wife. Anything which can be counted, which can be measured, must be absolutely equal. That is the condition. By Khitum Allah Ta'abilu, permission is there. You can have two wives, three wives, four wives at a time. But this is the condition. You have to fulfill this justice. Only there is one exception. There may be, you know, your heart is more inclined to one and not that much inclined to the other. But this is beyond your control. And this will be made clear in this very surah. We shall find in the next passages that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted that this is the weakness of man. So this is pardonable. But whatever can be measured or counted in that absolute equality has to be maintained. Time, money, dresses, etc., etc., dwelling, they must be absolutely equal at par with each other. وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدَلُوا فَوَاحِدَةٌ وَمَا مَلَكَتْ عِمَانَكُمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ عِمَانَكُمْ And in addition to the wives, you can have those slave girls whom your right hands possess. They are besides. They are not counted in wives. Wives are separate. ذَلِكْ عَدْنَا اللَّا تَعُولُوا This is more likelier that you won't go astray and you won't be deviate, you won't deviate from the right path. So if you keep only one wife, you are saved from doing any injustice. You will not be responsible on the day of judgment for any injustice to any of one of them. So it's better to have one. This is persuasion. It's safer to have one. But you are allowed, there can be circumstances that a person needs more than one wife. You can, but you have to do justice. Full justice to all your wives. And not beyond four. Again, and give over to the women their dowry, their bridal money, mahar, which we call. Sadokat, this is Sadokat. Singular is Sadak. Sadak means the bridal money which a husband pays to the bride, which we call Mahar. So you must pay the Mahar or the bridal money or the door or the dowry with pleasure. Don't think it's some fine that you have to pay. It's not a fine, it's a present to your would-be wife. And you know, sadaqah means arms or charity. And the plural is sadaqat. So please differentiate sadaqat and sadaqat. Sadaqat is from sadaqah. And sadaqat is from sadaq. And sadaq is the bridal money which is paid by the husband to the bride, to the wife at the time of marriage. وَآتُ النِّسَا صَدُقَاتِ هِنَّ نِحْلَةِ فَإِنْ تِبْنَ لَكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ If they on their own concede some part of their dowry to you. Well, you had promised me ten thousand dollars. Well, I give you one thousand out of it. I am ready to accept nine thousand. Okay. It's her authority. He, she, she can do it. Fakuluhu honey and Maria. You can eat it. You can use it. Consume it. And you can consume it with pleasure. And doing no good to you. No bad to you. وَلَا تُوتُ السُّفَهَا أَمْوَالَكُمْ أَلَّتِي جعل الله لكم قياما and don't hand over your properties to the feeble minded sufaha foolish feeble minded retarded mentally there are people perhaps an orphan is retarded in mind mentally retarded his father had left much property for him now, if you hand over that property to this person, he will spoil it. Because he doesn't have the intelligence and the understanding and the wisdom and the maturity of thinking. Don't hand over the property to such people. You know, it is in these type of cases that during the British Raj in India, there was court of war. If there was such 
minor people who inherited big properties, that those properties were not left at their own like or dislike, at their own disposal. But the government managed it for them, and they were allowed only annual expenditure out of the income of that property. That was called court of war, and this is something which is necessary in a society, because there can be people who don't know what is good for them, what is bad for them. وَلَا تُوتُوا الصُّفَاءَ وَعَلَكُمُ الَّتِي جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ قِيَامًا These properties, these belongings, these things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made support for you in this world. So if you give them over to these people who are not mentally fit, who are not mentally up to mark, then you are spoiling it. And this is going to be a loss to the community, not to the, to the individual alone. وَرْزُقُوهُمْ فِيهَا But you feed them from that. Vaksuhum and clothe them, give the proper clothing, give the proper food, out of the income of that property. Vakulu lahum kaulam marufa and say to them kind words. Don't be harsh to them, although they are mentally retarded. But you know, don't be harsh to them. You have to be to treat them gently. Vakulu yatama hatta ida balagul nikah and keep on testing the orphans. Till such time that they become, they come of age, they reach the age of marriage, they reach the age of puberty. Now they are not minors, they are adults. If you see that they are intelligent, they can very well understand what is good for them, what is bad for them. Now hand over to them their property which was under, in your custody. It was the property of the orphan. His father had left that property for him, but because he was a minor, you were the guardian, you were the custodian. But now when he has come of age, and now when he, is, he has reached the age of puberty, hand over their property to them. وَلَا تَاكُلُوهَا إِسْرَافًا Don't eat it up. إِسْرَافًا Extravagantly. وَبِدَارًا أَنْ يَكْبَرُوا And hastily. Fearing that they may become majors, they become adults, so that you are finishing it up before they become adults. Don't do it. These were the things that were being done over there. This was this, these were the social evils in that society. And now when, you know, Muslims had a society of their own, a system of their own, a state of their own, so to say, now it had, the society had to be reformed from all respects. You see how much detailed the Quran is giving these instructions. Don't do any injustice to any, any section of the society, especially the weaker section. Women are weak. So are the orphans. And if a guardian of an orphan is himself rich and self-sufficient, he should abstain and he should not take anything out of the property of the orphan whom whose he is looking after. But Vaman Kana Fakiran is some guardian is poor and he is devoting his time, he is looking after the property of the orphan. So he can take something on that account from the property of the orphan. But then they should do it in a good way. Not that they are drawing heavy sums and heavy salaries out of the property. But you know the thing which is correct. Just and fair. And when you have handed over to them their properties, take witnesses. Lest the orphan says, no, he didn't give it to me. You know, the detailed instructions, these are real matters, real problems. How many disputes can arise? So have witnesses that this was the property left by his father. Today, I am handing it over. You be witnesses to it. Ashidu alayhim. Wa kafa billahi hasiba. And Allah is sufficient to reckon he will take the account himself also. Don't think 
that if you have kept an account of the property of the orphan and you have, have the witnesses also, and now there is no other place where you are answerable and responsible, on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also take the account. Had you taken it justly or not? لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا تَرَكَ الْوَالِدَانِ وَالْأَقْرَبُونَ For men is also a portion from what was left by their parents or near relatives. Now this is the law of inheritance which will be decided, which will be discussed in detail in the second section. This is just a preamble for that. لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا تَرَكَ الْوَالِدَانِ وَالْأَقْرَمُونَ Both the parents, father and mother, whatever they have left. Now men also have a share from that inheritance. وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا تَرَكَ الْوَالِدَانِ وَالْأَقْرَمُونَ And in the same way, women have also a share. Now this is a very big reformation, reform which was being done by Islam. Because before Islam, there was no share of inheritance for women. There is still no share in inheritance in Hindus till this time. No share. The inheritor is only the male and in most of the cases only the eldest son. Even the smaller sons and younger sons and daughters, they are just deprived of everything. So that the holding remains big. It is not divided and distributed. That is the custom in many societies. But Quran says no. لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا تَرَكَ الْوَالِدَانِ وَالْأَقْرَبُونَ وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا تَرَكَ الْوَالِدَانِ وَالْأَقْرَبُونَ مِمَّا قَلَّ مِنْهُ أَوْ كَسُرُ Whether that property or whatever has been left by the parents or the relatives is small or great, it doesn't matter. Howsoever small it is, you have to divide it according to the divine law. If it is great, it has to be divided. If it is small, مِمَّا قَلَّ مِنْهُ أَوْ كَسُرُ don't think, oh, it's a very small thing. Why to divide it? No. This is the commandment of Allah. Nasibam mafruda. These portions, you know, they have been ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a human law that can be amended and changed. It has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِذَا حَذَرَ الْقِسْمَةَ أُولُو الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ And... When at the time of division of the inheritance, some relatives also come and they are present and there are some orphans also. They are not the inheritors, not the son, not the daughter of the deceased, but they are of orphans of the family. They may be related, but you know, a distant relations. Well, masakin or the poor, if they also, they are present, destitutes are also present, Give them also, فَاتُوهُمْ مِنْهُ وَقُولُوا فَرْزُقُوهُمْ مِنْهُ وَقُولُوا لَهُمْ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Give something out of that inheritance to them also and talk to them in a very gentle way. Kind words. وَالْيَحْسَ الَّذِينَ لَوْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ ذُرِّيَةً ضِعَافًا And those who are dividing that property now, they should fear. Now this is khashiya. Khashiya means fear. Khauf means fear. If they should think about it, that had they been in the place of this person deceased, and had they been living, leaving behind them minor sons or daughters, how much they would be fearing about their future. Khafu alayhim. A man is dying and he is leaving minor sons, minor daughters. How much he will be mindful about the future of these, these kids, who will look after them? They need protection, they need support. I am dying. Who will look after them? So you should keep it in mind. So now if the other orphans are coming, they were also the sons of some deceased person. Be kind to them, so that if that time comes, God forbid, but if that time comes for your kids and sons and daughters, People will be kind to them also if you are kind to the orphans today. Well, yes, the Zina law, Taraku, Min Khalfin, Zuriat, and Zayaf, and Hafu Alehim, Falyatakulla. So that they should have regard of Allah. Well, Yakulu, Colin, Sadida, and they must say the correct words, the straight words. In the Ladina Yakuluna, Amwal, and Yatama, Zulman, verily those who are eating up the property of the orphans. 
ان ظلمن انما ياكلون في انما ياكلون في بطونه النار they are filling their bellies with fire بس يسلون سعيرا and they shall enter a blazing fire don't think that if you have consumed the property of the orphan well you have consumed it no this is not the property of the orphan that you have consumed and put in your bellies it's the fire of hell it will appear on the day of judgment that 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 was actually that they were the living cinders of fire you see kum allah fi auladikum i think we should take one and a half hours in this session or maybe two hours because we can't say four tarawi with only 10 ayat so we have to say at least four tarawi for that we must have some ayat you know so let it be two hours yusikum allah fi auladikum allah subhanahu wa taala enjoins upon you regarding your children liz zakar e mislu hazul sayan this is a very profound place of the quran this section can consist of only four ayat and in two ayat the whole law of inheritance has been stated here and people you know who are experts on this law of inheritance they have written full volumes full books based on these two ayat they are so profound it's a miracle of quran you see kum allah fi auladikum Now this is the beginning of the law of inheritance in Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala enjoins upon you about your sons and daughters, your children. Number one thing: Liz zakare mislu hazil un sayen. For the male, there is a portion equal to the portion of two females. This is one principle, basic principles. For the son, twice the share of the daughter. For the mother, for the father. twice the share of the mother that is the general principle for the males that is that is why the word is liz zakare mislu hazil un sayen for the males and here it is sons because aulad you see kum allah fi auladikum liz zakare mislu hazil un sayen the son will get the share equal to the share of two daughters fa in kunna nisan fawqasna tain but if there are only daughters more than two or even two also falahunna sulusa ma tarak they will have only two third of the property of the deceased not all of it the one third will go to some other people you know that is not discussed here that is given by the hadith fa in kanat wahidatan and if it is only one daughter the only daughter no son no other daughter she will inherit falahun nis half of the property not the whole of the property the half the rest half will go to some other people to the brothers of the deceased etc etc but if a one daughter is the inheritor only she will have only half what does it mean if there is only one son then the whole property will be inherited by him the son will because this zakare mr hazil un sayen because for the male the share is equal to the share of the two daughters two two males females so if there is only one son he will inherit the whole property if he, if it is only one daughter she will have only half wali abawayh li kulli wahid minhum as-sudus mimma taraka in kana lahu walad now you come to the you know parents if the deceased person has progeny has sons and daughters then to the parents to the father and mother both one sixth will go that is one third in total the kull wahid minhum as sudus one sixth from what the deceased has left if he had some sons or daughters fa in lam yakul lahu waladun wa warisa abawa warisahu abawahu and if he had the deceased had no sons or daughters no offspring now the only inheritors the sole inheritors are the parents father and the mother for the umm his sulus then for the mother will be the one third of the whole of property now if the one third goes to mother what goes to the father two third again it is complete fa in kana lahu ikhwatun fa li umm his sulus but if there are you know brothers and sisters of the deceased then for the mother will be one third one sixth min baadi wasiyati yusi bihaud and 
and this distribution will be made after if any bequest had been bequeathed, that will be fulfilled. And after if there was any loan on the deceased, that loan will be paid. This division and distribution will be after two things. you see behind then if there is some bequest that has to be fulfilled. And number two, if there is some loan, that has to be paid first. And then the rest of the property will be distributed according to this law of inheritance. Abaukum wa abnaukum. Your sons or your fathers. La tadruna ayyuhum akrabu lakum lafan. You don't know who is nearer to you in benefit. Because this is Allah who knows. What should go to the parents? What should go to the offsprings? This is Allah. He decides. Farizatam min Allah. This is an injunction. This is an ordinance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah kana aliman hakima. And verily Allah is all knowing, all wise. His wisdom is complete. His knowledge is complete. And He is giving you these instructions out of His total wisdom, out of His total knowledge. وَلَكُمْ نِسْوَ مَا تَرَكَ عَزْوَاجُكُمْ إِلَّمْ يَكُلْ لَهُنَّ وَلَدْ And you will have half of the property of your wives if they have no offspring. A woman dies without any offspring, no son, no daughter. Now the inheritor is this husband. But he will get half of the property. The rest of half will go to the brothers and sisters of that woman, that deceased woman. لَكُمْ نِسْفُ مَا تَرَكَ عَزْوَاجُكُمْ إِنْ لَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُنَّ وَلَدْ If the woman didn't have any offspring or children. فَإِنْ كَانَ لَهُنَّ وَلَدٌ But if she had some offspring, daughters or sons, فَلَكُمُ الرُّبْعُ مِمَّا تَرَكْنَا Then you will inherit only one-fourth of what they have left. مِمْ بَعْدِ وَسِيَةٍ يُسِينَ بَهَا أَوْ دَيْن And again the same two conditions. After the bequest that she had bequeathed, and after the payment of the loan. Wallahunna rubo, now the, the opposite. Wallahunna rubo, and she will, in, and they will, and the, the women, the wives, they will inherit one fourth mimma taraktum of what you have left in lam yakul lakum walad. If you do not have any sons or daughters, then the wife will have one fourth. Fa in kana lakum waladun, but if you have a daughter or a son, an offspring, فَلَهُنَّ مِمَّا تَرَكْتُمْ Then they will inherit from your property inheritance only one-eighth. Again the same principle, male and female. Rub and Sumun, one-fourth, one-eighth. مِمَّا تَرَكْتُمْ مِمْ بَعْدِ وَسِيَّةٍ تُوسُونَ بِهَا Then the same two conditions, after the bequest had been bequeathed and after the loan had been paid. وَإِنْ كَانَ رَجُلٌ يُرَسُوا قَلَالَهُ Now there is another condition. A person who has left property and he has died, and he is Kalala. What is Kalala? He has no inheritor, not even in the sons or daughters, nor in the parents. We call it Usul and Faro. Asal is the root. The root of the person are the parents, from where he has come. This is Asal, Usul. Faro, branches. Branches are the sons and the daughters. So primary inheritors are the usul, that is the parents, and the pharaoh, and that is the offspring, sons and daughters. This is the primary inheritance. Then secondarily, wife and husband, husband and wife. So they are the first circle of inheritance. Now if a person, whether he is a woman or a man, he or she has died, she had no, or he had no sons or daughters, nor the parents were alive. Now such a woman or a man is called kalala. وَإِنْ كَانَ رَجُلٌ يُورَسُ قَلَالَةً أَوْ إِمْرَاتٌ In this both the cases, whether he is a male or a female, she is a female. If they don't have any sons or daughters or parents alive, وَلَهُ أَخُلْ وَأُخْتٌ But they have that kalala, that man or woman, they have either one brother or one sister. فَلِكُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِّنْهُمَ السُّدُسِ and now this will be very clear in the last ayah of this surah, ayah number 176, that here the sisters and brothers are those from mother's side only. We say that he is my real brother. What do you mean? That father is the same, mother is the same. 
But if father or mother is different, only you, the common is one. Either the father is common or the mother is common. We call them stepbrothers. Sotele bhai behen. In Arabic, in, 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 according to Islamic law, there are three types. Aini allati akhlafi. Any brothers and sisters are those who have common brother, common father, common mother. Number two, father is common, but the mothers are different. They are called allati. Mother is the same, fathers are different, then they are called akhlafi. So this is the case of the akhlafi. In, according to the sharia, if the father is common, it is irrelevant whether the mother is common or not. They are real brothers. Real sisters. Mothers may be different. Because it is the, 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 the male, the, the father, who is the deciding, decisive factor. So they are called reals. Akhyafi for the akhyafi, where only the mother is common, fathers are different. This is the case of the akhyafi. If a woman or man dies without having any parents alive or any sons or daughters, and they have only akhyafi, only those type of step brothers or sisters, who are only from the mother's side, then for each one of them is only one-sixth of the inheritance. If there are so many brothers and sisters, then the property will be divided among them. This one-sixth will be divided in, in fissurus. One-third will be divided between them equally. And this will also happen after that wasiyah. That request has been completed, fulfilled, or the loan has been given. Ghaira mubar, without harming anyone. What can be the, the conditions of harming? For example, somebody has made a bequest for his own son. He had crossed the limits of the Sharia. For those whose share in inheritance is fixed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can't give any wasiya for them. So if somebody has done something wrong, well, that must be rectified. The divine law will be supreme. The portions of the inheritors have been fixed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The son will get his own share according to the Sharia. The daughter will get her own share according to the Sharia. You can't make any wasiya, any bequest in favor of the son or the daughter, or the father or the mother. This, this bequest can be for others. For some charity works, for some other distant relations, for some orphans, and so on. But if the wasiya is for the for the waris, then it is not you know obligatory, but, but rather it is false. And this is injunction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many times you see this is being repeated? So that you must be mindful that you can't make any changes, any amendments. This is the ordinance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu alimul hakeem. And Allah is alim, all-knowing, hakeem, all-wise. Tilka hududullah. And these are the limits placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alimul halim, I'm sorry. He is the knower and forbearing. He is forbearing. He doesn't punish you immediately. He gives you time to amend your ways. He is Halim. So he, this is his Hilm. Wallahu Alimul Halim. Tilka Hududullah, these are the limits placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again the emphasis. And how lightly we take this matter. What percentage of Muslims are serious about these matters? There were Muslims in India, and there must be today even in Bharat and Pakistan, both and Bangladesh, they used to stand up in the British courts and say, we don't accept the law of inheritance of Islam. We want the law of the inheritance of our rivaj, what is there, you know, in our society. We want a decision according to rivaj, or we want a decision according to the British law. We are not ready to accept Islamic law, and they were Muslims. They declared it. And you know the emphasis here. Tilka hududullah. Wa man yuti'i allaha wa rasoolahu yudkhilhu jannatin tajri min taat al-anhar. These are the limitations which have been prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So whosoever obeys Allah and his messenger, he will make him enter those gardens, Tajri min al anhar, underneath which rivers will be flowing, Khalidina fiha, and they will abide therein forever. Bazalik al fadul azim, and that is a very great achievement indeed. Whosoever is made to enter paradise, what greater achievement and success can be there? وَمَنْ يَعْسِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And whosoever disobeys Allah and his, and his messenger, وَيَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَهُ And he tramples the limits placed by, transgresses the limits placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يُدْخِلْهُ nara. He will make him to enter the fire, خَالِدًا fiha To abide there forever. وَلَهُ عَذَابٌ muhin And there... He will have a humiliating chastisement, punishment. I think we should stop here and we should pray four rakat of Tarawi. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al Azim wa nafani wa yakum bil ayati masdik al Hakim. Allahu Akbar. The Islamic Organization of North America, IONA, is an organization dedicated to reviving the Quran into the hearts of Muslims while bringing its message to non-Muslims. The obligations of a Muslim as ordained by the Quran and Sunnah can be understood as having four levels. 1. A Muslim is required to develop real faith and conviction, Iman, in one's heart. 2. A Muslim is required to live a life of complete submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 3. A Muslim is required to propagate and disseminate the message of Islam to humanity as a whole. 4. A Muslim is required to try his utmost in establishing the just Islamic order. The first and foremost objective of establishing IONA is to assist the Muslims in North America to uphold and implement these obligations first on themselves, their families, inform their friends, and then to invite the non-Muslims to Islam. The ultimate goal is to seek Allah's pleasure and salvation in the hereafter. For more information about Iona, please visit us at www.tanzim.us. You may also email us at info at tanzeem.us or call our toll-free number, 866-779-IONA. Join us. Together, we can make a difference.